Welcome everybody again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the humans behind the really big ideas that are shaping our world and inspiring the future and future creators. And for all those like great stories, I'm Ira Pastor, your health and life sciences ambassador along for the journey. So um, a little background to the show today. Um, for Gary and Mary West, uh, what started as an entrepreneurial journey way back in the 1970s when they co-founded a small telemarketing company in the garage of their house in Omaha, Nebraska, ultimately turned into a, a multi-billion dollar American telecommunications uh, success story known as the West Corporation, uh, employing close to 36,000 people. Uh, and, and as wonderful uh, an entrepreneurial success story as that is, uh, what happened next is an equally fascinating story where this uh, amazing couple uh, now has taken parts of their fortune and then, you know, instead of investing in private islands and uh, trying to get to Mars and things like that, they are spending literally hundreds of millions of dollars in supporting causes, including but not limited to senior citizen wellness and cutting the nation's uh, burgeoning healthcare costs. Um, we're honored to be joined today by Shelley Lyford, uh, who is President and Chief Executive Officer of West Health, the Gary and Mary West Foundation, and the West Health Institute. Uh, solely funded uh, by Gary and Mary West Philanthropy, West Health is a family of nonpartisan, uh, nonprofit organizations dedicated to lowering health care costs, enabling seniors to successfully age in place with access to high quality, affordable health and support services that ultimately preserve and protect their dignity, quality of life and independence. Uh, with a master's degree in international relations and political economics from the University of San Diego, uh, Ms. Lightford has played a critical role in establishing the foundation back in 2006, and under her leadership uh, has awarded grants of over $220 million for a variety of applied medical research, policy initiatives, community support and social services, and so forth. Um, Ms. Lightford also leads the Gary and Mary West Health Institute as it conducts research on a wide range of healthcare issues affecting seniors and their families. Uh, she's also spearheaded the development of a variety of innovative healthcare delivery ecosystems, including Gary and Mary West Senior Emergency Care Unit at UC San Diego, which is uh, the nation's first accredited senior specific emergency department, as well as the Gary and Mary West PACE Initiative in Northern San Diego, uh, which helps, uh, it, sets a, it was a, a gold standard program helping set the standard for aging in place uh, at home rather than in nursing homes. She's also overseen the development of a first of its kind nonprofit, Gary Mary West Senior Dental Center, to ultimately ensure low income seniors have access to high quality, affordable dental care. I've been involved in many of the uh, collaborations with various organizations uh, throughout the organization's history, from the American College of Emergency Physicians, Brown University, Dartmouth, Duke, Meals on Wheels America, a very long list. Uh, she was recently appointed for a three-year term as commissioner on the California Commission on Aging, uh, which advises the state's governor and legislature uh, on a variety of plans related to California Master Plan for Aging Stakeholder Advisory Committee. Um, if, if that's not enough, <laughs> uh, she also serves as the vice chair for um, Civic RX. Uh, she's uh, on the board of directors there. And it's a fascinating not for profit generic drug company, uh, which helps patients by addressing shortages and lowering the cost of medication. Uh, prior to the work at the foundation, she was the director of the Cystic Fibosis Foundation, the Joan B. Crock Institute for Peace and Justice at the University of San Diego, and currently sits on the executive committee of the Grant Makers in Aging. Um, Shelly Lightford, welcome. <laughs> welcome to the Hi. show. Hi. Hi. Greetings from San Diego. It's great to be with you. It's great to see you. It's great to see you. You know, Shelly, typically um, we start off the show just by giving our guests the floor for a little while to talk about themselves. We would love to, you know, hear the story of how uh, a young girl growing up on the uh, the dairy farms of Vermont ultimately <laughs> uh, ended up <laughs> running this incredible uh, network of organizations that you uh, head uh, nowadays. Great, Ira, again, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be with, be with you and be with um, all of your listeners. Um, yes, I have had a really amazing journey. And uh, one, I, if you look over my shoulder, you mm -hmm. can see a photograph of my grandfather who uh, was the, the founder of um, the Cold, Spring, Cold Springs Farm in Chelsea, Vermont. Okay. Chelsea is a small 
community, a very small, very typical New England village, about 1,200 people. And uh, I was blessed to grow up on the Cold Springs farm. Uh, my family, my mom and dad and their four daughters, lived about um, 500 yards away from the dairy farm and my grandparents. Um, my grandparents were very proud, uh, very um, ingenuitive um, individuals who didn't get to go to college themselves, but made sure all five of their children did mm -hmm. and all of their grandchildren did as well. And I really grew up in a multi-generational home, even though I had my own mom and dad and, and my own three sisters, mm -hmm. I spent most of the time with my grandparents on the farm. And so a Friday night, a big Friday night, for me growing up was playing cards with my grandparents and making and eating popcorn mm -hmm. and um, going out for a ride on the back roads of Vermont and um, learning about gardening and learning about caring for animals and mm -hmm. learning about caring for each other and for our family. And um, so when I think about my unique upbringing, it was always multi-generational. I wasn't looking to go out with boys on a Friday night or uh, go to a club or to a movie. I was very excited about learning from my grandparents and spending time with them. So mm -hmm. that was ingrained in me in a very young age. Um, and uh, I felt that I had this unique opportunity and when I would bring my friends home from university and we would go home, home to my home, it was always to my grandparents' house. and. Um, and so that's unique in America. And I, I think that you probably agree with that, Ira. Um, after university, I had an opportunity to move to Japan. Mm -hmm. And I knew how unique my upbringing was as a young person. But then I went to Japan, and there was an even greater spotlight on the fact that elders and seniors mm -hmm. are revered. And they're a critical part of society. Actually, there, there are kind of two people who are very revered in Japan that I think that we should learn in America uh, from, from the Japanese, and that is our seniors, sure. and it's also our teachers. Sure. Okay. And so we learn a thing or two. So I, um, I had this wonderful opportunity again, and it was kind of like a turning point, Ira, for me, think, thinking like I have this unique upbringing in this very small town in Vermont and here I am in Japan a very dense densely populated country where everybody has an upbringing like me where multi-generational families are together right. and and kids are with are with older adults and, and, and learn and prosper. And so I was very excited to come home and, and try to do something here in the United States that was focused on shining a light on this amazing group of individuals and talent and wisdom that we have here and that we discard for the most part. Yeah. Um, we live in an ageist society. And um, I was very excited about doing something to start breaking down those barriers. And um, I'll just I'll share one anecdote with you sure, just kind sure. of about breaking Please. down barriers and um, about this really kind of pivotal moment in my life when I was in Japan. Um, I went to Japan not knowing the language mm -hmm. and uh, I went there to coach basketball okay. and, uh, and, and also teach English in three different schools. And I was in a small community. I was actually the first Caucasian to ever live in my community mm -hmm. and the first American to ever live in this, this kind of small fishing village, about 5,000 people um, in Kagoshima, which is uh, down in Kyushu, a okay. southern, the southern island. And um, I lived in a beautiful house. So a lot of my colleagues that had been in Japan, that were in Japan with me, were living in apartments, you know, the size of this desk. Sure. Um, but I was in an actual beautiful traditional home and my neighbor was a World War II veteran mm -hmm. and he was a rice farmer. And so there were big rice patties between his house and my house. And he was missing both of his arms mm -hmm. from the war. And um, I um, had a bike and I would ride my bike past his home and I had a little backpack and I would pedal to a market and I would put my groceries in my backpack and pedal back home and go past his house and I would see him and I would bow and kind of wave and he really 
didn't pay me much attention. And um, I came home one night from school and there was a basket on my bike and a little bell. And he watched me for weeks and weeks, put my groceries in my backpack. And then he put a, a basket on my bike and um, was reticent to really talk to me. Didn't really, wasn't, I, I could tell it was a little bit uneasy about having an American living next to him. Yeah. And um, we, we suffered great wounds and, and life-changing wounds in the war. And, um, you know, gave me this, this gift. And then we had an earthquake oh. and it was a big earthquake. And he was the first person at my house to check on me. And from that moment, like we just created this bond. And um, I think about him every day. I think about my grandfather every day. I think about the compassion and the dignity and the um, honor that um, older Americans should be given, older adults throughout the world. And that this guy overcame a bias towards yeah. me, an American woman who probably doesn't know about history, um, all of a sudden to, you know, kind of take me under his wing and teach me about um, growing rice. And, and just, it was this really wonderful, lovely friendship that, that grew in Japan. And so coming home and having the opportunity to sit down and meet amazing entrepreneurs mm -hmm. like Gary and Mary West, really provided me with this amazing platform to help Gary and Mary create something beautiful, something unique, something impactful, and something that basically, Ira, nobody else in the United States is doing. And so I'd love just to talk to you a little bit about West Health mm -hmm. and about Gary and Mary West's vision for successful aging and a kind of the, the different components we're putting together to create a different trajectory for aging in America. And I'm very excited about it. I'm excited about the things that you touched on in the introduction, everything from geriatric emergency departments to PACE clinics to Civica RX, the first of its kind generic nonprofit drug company in America mm -hmm. and how we're pulling everything together to work and to create healthcare that is more affordable, where healthcare is accessible, where we can deploy platforms like telehealth in the home and we mm -hmm. can move data rather than fragile seniors or fragile patients um, to assure the best quality of life in this country. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to love to go into all of that with you. Uh, it, it's a it's a fascinating background story, and I can clearly hear and feel your passion. Yeah. And it just seems like a perfect uh, that, that that you found Gary and Mary West, and uh, I mean making this click um, is is wonderful. Um, could could you take a little time because you know I, I have to be honest, you know why you um, I, I'm always like extremely impressed by the the wealthy people that sit in the back, you don't know their name, but they do so much as opposed to the ones you hear about. And I was jokingly talking about folks that you hear about building spaceships and buying private islands all the time. But here's a couple, um, I mean, an amazing entrepreneurial journey. Uh, and, you know, they could be buying private islands and doing all yeah. sorts of other stuff, but here they are, as you were saying, coming back to this concept that there's these other people in society, we, need, we respect them, they have so much value, we discard them so much, um, more than we should. And, and, and you're building this beautiful ecosystem. Talk a little bit, just if you would, uh, to yeah. introduce for the audience, especially uh, the US audience, but from the foreign audience, who are Gary and Mary West and, and why, why aging? Because um, uh, unfortunately, when I do, I do the show and I have these guests on uh, that talk about new technologies for, for a, aging or longevity, what have you. And everyone's always upset about the fact, you know, why does this billionaire that has, you know, $20 billion, why does he invest in uh, robots and not uh, aging? So let's just talk about Gary and Mary West, if you would, and why they went down this path. Yes. So Gary and Mary West are incredible entrepreneurs. And really, when you think about the American dream, Ira, they have lived it. They have worked every day of their life to create 
a great deal of wealth that now they are going to deploy towards their philanthropic legacy. So for many, many years, their legacy was creating West Corporation mm -hmm. and was creating jobs. They created 40,000 jobs. They started their company in their own garage of their very um, you know, middle income ranch house in Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, then they went through this wonderful liquidity event. And with that event, we were able to create the Gary and Mary West Foundation in mm -hmm. 2006. And at that point, Gary and Mary West, who are very down to earth, humble Midwesterners, no, no, no flash. Yep. Uh, Gary's gonna be wearing Nike sneakers, a pair of Levi's and a sweatshirt. Um, and they are, uh, they, they, they don't have, don't lead an extravagant lifestyle at all. Um, they're very dedicated to each other. Mm -hmm. um, they are dedicated to their friends and family, and they are dedicated to seniors in this country and very dedicated to veterans. Gary and Mary are very patriotic and they are parlaying their patriotism mm -hmm. into doing something great for America. And listen, they think, and I agree with them, if we're not getting older every single day, we are in big trouble. <laughs> uh, the alternative of not growing older is not great. And so they want to make that experience better for all veterans, for all of the great people that have built our country, that have taught our children. And, and so to that end, as they were thinking about their philanthropic legacy in 2006. And mind you, they weren't really thinking about this prior to 2006 because they've been so focused on wealth creation and building their businesses. Mm -hmm. And Gary and Mary both thought what we're doing for America is creating jobs. Yep. 40,000 of them, that, that's, that's a pretty darn patriotic, great thing Absolutely. to do right there. Putting a lot of kids in college and supporting a lot of families that way. Um, but then they were able to kind of start to switch over and they themselves had to care for their aging parents. Mm -hmm. And I read they've got all the money in the world. Like you said, they could be buying football teams. They could be buying islands. They could be living on a fabulous yacht in the Mediterranean. And they themselves uh, toiled with and, and had a difficult time navigating the healthcare system and trying to get care into their to the home for mm -hmm. their growing their their senior parents and coordinating care and getting prescription drugs and paying for things and they you know they were able to pay for things but it was still incredibly difficult and and they had you know home health workers who would come in and, and steal things and you know all the things that all of us face as we care for our aging parents our aging loved ones um, they went through themselves they were not immune to it and that was a turning point for them they've always been very focused on technology and they love technology platforms and very excited about the advances that we have in telehealth yep. but this is more than a platform this is more than IT. This is more than a gadget. This is about what can we do to systemically change the trajectory of aging in America to make it easier. And so we have to encompass the four walls of a healthcare system because traditionally that's what we've done in America. You know, we, 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 when someone gets old in America, we rarely as a family take care of them at home. There's a, a nursing home, there's a, a SNF, there's a hospital, there, there are other forms of um, care that we generally farm out to. Yep. And that's very expensive. And as Gary and Mary were thinking about their philanthropic legacy, they're thinking about, oh my gosh, almost 20% of our GDP is dedicated to healthcare in this country. Every eight seconds, someone in this country turns 65 years old. Mm -hmm. We're going through an amazing demographic shift. Seniors are discarded in this country. Like this is kind of a perfect storm. We need to come together. We need to talk to billionaires. We need to talk to philanthropists. We need to talk to foundations about why this is the right place to invest. You know, I, I talk about this quite a bit. There are um, about 105,000 private foundations in the United States, okay. about 105,000. Wow. There are less than 10 
that are solely dedicated to aging in this country. That is less than one one thousandth of a percent of philanthropy dedicated to the fastest growing demographic in our country. Yep. Now, if that isn't shining a light on ageism, I don't know what is. Now listen, we of course want to continue to provide funding and philanthropic dollars to youth and to the environment and to all the worthy causes that we have in this country. But we are all getting older and our system is broken and we need a better form of care. And listen, what is good for a senior is good for everyone. Absolutely. It is good for everyone. And so Gary and Mary are really championing this movement of um, breaking down ageism, breaking down barriers. We have to lower the cost of healthcare. They're entrepreneurial, they're innovative. We love these new innovative models of care. Yep. And we have created three separate entities that work together in a very cohesive way to, to maintain and create sustainable results. So I always think about what we do and we're solely dedicated to lowering the cost of healthcare to improve aging in America. Mm -hmm. But we have three separate entities okay. and the entities work together. And so let me tell you about each of those entities please, please. and how they work together to create sustainable change in America. Okay. We launched in 2006 with the Gary and Mary West Foundation. Traditional non-operating private foundation. Um, we've provided about $225 million in grant funding to about 580 grantees over that time. So we generally give pretty big grants, multi-year grants, to um, different nonprofit entities to do something impactful in the community. We like to do multi-year, as I said, mm -hmm. and we kind of tranche the grants, almost like venture capital. Okay. So there are metrics and, and we're not micromanagers, but we're pretty hands-on and we measure our results and we expect a return on our investment. Now, when I say return on investment, I don't expect money back in our coffers. I'm looking at like, how have we improved their operations? How many people have we served, et cetera? So we're looking at the social impact with respect to our return on investment. So we then, as we got into this, we thought, you know, very interested in healthcare, very interested in changing healthcare, models of healthcare. We've got to decrease the amount of money that we spend on healthcare in America. Um, so we did a scan of the United States looking at the different folks that we could invest in. And we came to the conclusion that we should create our own applied medical research organization. Okay. And so that's called the West Health Institute. That's down in La Jolla, uh, California. We're right next to the Scripps Research Institute, the Salk mm -hmm. Institute. We're on that beautiful mesa with all of the different uh, medical research organizations. We're unique because we are applied we're very focused on the translation of our research and where the rubber meets the road. Now we have a great deal of respect for all of the basic research institutes like the Salk Institute who are eventually going to cure cancer and they're at the bench and there are a lot of really smart, amazing folks wearing white jackets doing experiments and, and focused on that research. We are different. We're focused on applied systematic change and so we work with academic medical centers and 501c3 hospitals across the United States on different research projects. And we've got three portfolios of work. One is dedicated to acute care. One is dedicated to uh, the management of chronic conditions. And the third is dedicated to long-term supports and services. Okay. So within those three portfolios, we provide research dollars and collaboration with some of the folks that you mentioned in the very beginning, UNC Chapel Hill, Duke, Brown, um, UC San Diego, UC San Francisco, all of those medical centers are working with us on different endeavors related to aging and different models of care. So we create this research. We have very compelling data. Okay. We package that data up and we send it over to the West Health Policy Center, okay. which is located in Washington, DC. And the policy center's focus and mission is to create more enlightened policy 
that is focused on aging, that is focused on seniors, and that is focused on lowering the cost of healthcare. And so we've done these research studies, these experiments, we've got this interesting data, mm -hmm. things have been published, and now we're able to advocate and enlighten and talk to different policymakers about different ways to move forward. And so we've been working on, on telehealth for many, many years and have done a lot of telehealth projects. Mm -hmm. um, and um, with our data and, and actually making lemonade out of lemons with COVID, oh, yeah. we've been able to show it's really important to have a payment mechanism in place to, um, to, to increase telehealth visits in homes for, for fragile patients and for veterans. Um, so we're very excited about the opportunity that we have there. Here in California, we're also advocating for things and, and looking to change po policy in the state of California. Okay. Now, I am delighted to have had my Vermont roots and now to be a Californian mm -hmm. and have, have been living in California for 20 years. And um, California is the fifth biggest economy in the world. Oh, yeah. Our senior population is going to double over the next 10 years. Yep. We have an amazing opportunity in this state to create a master plan for aging, which West Health is working on with, uh, with, with other stakeholders in the state, and to create a state, fifth biggest economy in the world, yep. that is senior friendly, that has models of care. And so to that end, what we've done here in San Diego County with West Health, we have created senior dental centers. Okay. Den for the most part, oral health in seniors is ignored. Yep. And it is ignored primarily because it is expensive and because there is not a dental benefit associated with Medicare. Yep. So I'm lucky that, in, that I do live in California and we're one of 26 states that has a dental benefit through Medicaid. In California, that's called Dentical. Okay. So Medicaid is if you're poor or if you have a disability, not necessarily if you're old, but we're able to trigger that Medicaid benefit and it's cents on the dollar, but it covers some sort of, of, of oral health care. So we talk about dental deserts. And in America, we have huge pockets of dental deserts for older adults. Okay. And we did the research and we found, Ira, that a huge, not a, well, about 20% of emergency room visits were somehow associated with maladies related to oral health. So folks are, can't afford to go to the dentist, they have severe pain, and finally they just kind of throw up their hands and they go to the emergency department. Well, our emergency medicine physicians are not dentists, right? right? So they, they can't, but they know like, heck, that looks really bad. There's some bad stuff going on in there. There's an abscess. You know, what, what, what can we do? We can give you some antibiotics and we'll give you, what are we gonna give you? That, that's painful. Maybe we'll give you a narcotic for the pain. But now we can like segue into an opioid addiction as well, mm -hmm. or maybe that, you know, that antibiotic isn't going to do the trick. And then maybe that senior is going to come back to the emergency department in a week or two with something much worse like sepsis. So no pun intended, but we're trying to get to the root of the problem here. And we have um, created uh, two different dental centers, very, mm -hmm. just focused on seniors. It's amazing how we've been able to overcome barriers around transportation. We've been able to offset some of the costs of care mm -hmm. that are required through, um, through charitable donations and through the Medicaid benefit. We have collected data to show an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure mm -hmm. and actually lowering downstream healthcare costs by taking care of oral health problems. We've taken our data up to Sacramento. We've worked with different policymakers and advocated for better dental coverage. And we were able to get an increase in dental coverage for uh, poor, vulnerable seniors. Yeah. 
That is a success story. Absolutely. Because as, as wealthy as Gary and Mary West are, we can't populate the entire country with dental centers, yeah. but we can give you the blueprint of how to do it, how to collect the data, and how to help create meaningful policy changes at the state level to have a better benefit to stop these dental deserts. So that's an example of the foundation creating this dental center with several million dollars, deploying several million dollars of, of capital to create a dental center, doing the research with a medical research institute on, on the changes that a, a new system of care provides, packaging that data up, going to Sacramento, going to DC, and then uh, advocating for change. It's an amazing basket uh, of things that you're doing. Um, what, uh, I guess the question, um, you know, when you look at America overall uh, on this aging issue, um, obviously you've translated, as you're saying, you're taking these uh, concepts, you're working them on the, the state level and you want other, hopefully other uh, philanthropists, yeah. other uh, deep pocketed folks to mimic it in Wisconsin and Florida and Vermont and wherever. Um, what's the broad outlook for uh, 20 years from now where, where West the West model is everywhere in the United States because, you know, a few extra deep pocketed folks. That yeah. yeah, right. So I think it's a fabulous opportunity and our demographics are going to look so different in 20 years. Right. So different. Right. And so, you know, we have to change. We cannot afford the healthcare trajectory just in terms of, of cost, you know, it is going to bankrupt our country. So there has to be some meaningful change. We have a three point platform that we okay. talk about all the time in Washington and in, um, and in California and, and the worldwide. And that is in order to prepare us for 20 years from now, we need okay. to do three things. Okay. We need to lower the cost of prescription drugs. We need to move from fee for service billing and care to value based care. Okay. And we need to increase transparency in our healthcare system. So there are a lot of efforts underway right now on transparency. Um, if you haven't had Dr. Marty McCary as a guest on your show, I, I would invite you to do to 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 invite him to your show. He is uh, okay. from Johns Hopkins, and okay. and he's doing some amazing work right now, and uh, is really shepherding efforts around transparency in our healthcare system. We need to know how much things cost, yep. and, and we don't. Like Ira, can you imagine going to um, going to uh, a car dealership and um, picking out, I like that blue car. And it's like, great, blue car is gonna be good for you. This fits you, it suits you. And you drive off and have no idea how much it costs. And then three or four months later, you get a bill, <laughs> right? So, so the market doesn't yeah, work yeah. in healthcare. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't, so we need to change things. We need to have a more um, transparent, conversation with patients as we're d deciding on different forms of care. Um, so transparency, important initiative and underway and really excited about that. The second, moving from fee for service. So, you know, right now, I mean, we have the best doctors and nurses in the world, the best. Yep. We have the best innovation. We have the, the uh, uh, amazing. Um, but the way our system is set up, set up right now, doctors and healthcare systems are incented by fee for service billing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to prescribe more, yep. more tests, more scans, more diagnostics, more drugs, whatever that might be. And that necessarily might not be the best form of care. If there was if there was a different sort of, of way of operating where you weren't incented by money, by fees for services, um, we think that there would be much better healthcare outcomes. And there are a lot of efforts underway on that initiative. And I would invite you to um, ask um, 
Dr. Mark McCollin to join your show, okay. who um, was a former FDA commissioner and okay. also head of CMS. He now runs the Duke Margulis Policy Center, and a lot of his work is on the importance of moving away from fee-for-service billing and how that will improve the quality of care in America. And then finally, the third area, which I'm very passionate about, is lowering the cost of prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. um, we believe Medicare should be allowed to negotiate for drug prices, for, for, for the cost of drugs. Medicare is the biggest purchaser of drugs in America, yep. and it is precluded by law from negotiating the cost of those drugs. Unbelievable. I mean, we have neutered the biggest purchaser of drugs in America. It is antithetical to any sort of market economy. Mm -hmm. And so that needs to change, that must change. As we endeavor to create that change, there are some incremental things that we're doing. And one of them was to help launch Civica RX. Okay. So you mentioned that in the beginning of, of the show. Yep. Civica RX is uh, the very first of its kind, nonprofit, generic drug company. It was created by three foundations in mm -hmm. seven healthcare systems. Um, we have been in business for about, I'm very excited to be the vice chair of, mm -hmm. of that nonprofit organization. Um, and we've been operating for about two years. And in two years, we have um, secured and are uh, producing 40 different generic drugs. Excellent. Our focus is on creating a stable, accessible supply chain, as well as focusing on a lower cost of the drug. At any time you are to go on the FDA website, you'll see that there are over 200 life-saving drugs on shortage. Every day yep. in the emergency departments in our healthcare systems, doctors log in and they get a list of how many drugs they do not have access to. Yep. I read some of these things are like saline, very basic, simple, life-saving drugs that we do not have access to. And so our focus is to focus on that supply chain to assure that there is a stable, steady, accessible line of life-saving drugs. During COVID, we um, were very, very proud to say that um, Civica was the recipient of a $100 million grant mm -hmm. from HHS to create a state-of-the-art drug manufacturing facility um, to assure that we have these generic life-saving drugs in our national stockpile. Yes. I think COVID is shining a light on these extreme gaps and holes in our supply chain system, whether it be through personal protective equipment, through API, active pharmaceutical ingredient, a lot yep. of that comes from overseas, primarily China. We need to create those things in America. We need to be able to stockpile them in America and assure that in the event we have more pandemics in the future that we can care for not only our seniors, but all Americans. That's wonderful. Yeah, I was, uh, I was just uh, taking note of uh, the, the, the Civica grant, and then I saw something come across the wire this morning before I got on the, that uh, the Kodak company uh, is now getting into the drug business as well, similar type of thing that, you yeah. know, they can't, they can't film anymore. We don't need right. that, but right. we, do, we do need these drugs. So, right. Um, right. so yeah, it's, it's right. a, a really, another really neat initiative. Yeah. Um, and Ira, I bet that you know several people, I bet you've got loved ones in your life who yeah. have diabetes and are insulin dependent. Insulin was created in the 1920s. Oh yeah. And it was, um, it was created by two um, Canadian um, scientists and they sold it for um, two Canadian dollars. They immediately realized the public benefit, the public health benefit, and that we needed to get this out. Since 2010, the price of insulin has increased by 300% in America. 300%. It went from $90 for a vial to 300. This is a life sustaining drug. That is a generic drug that was created in the 1920s. This, this is price gouging. Yeah. This should, this is egregious and this is criminal. 
I'm sitting here smiling because just as a, a side note, I uh, um, I've always had a slightly elevated blood pressure, and I've been on uh, you know, okay. angi an angiotensin uh, blocking drug. Uh, I was, you know, I, I'm a pharmacist by undergraduate training, so I I've had I spent my time in 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 those trenches. But um, I remember looking at it, say, like, wow, my copay used to be eighty dollars, and when I, I was like so excited when I got the generic, the generic finally came out, I looked and the yeah. copay is like seventy five dollars. Wait, wait a second. This is not how it used to work. No. <laughs> this no. is not what what has happened to the generic system. So I yeah, I'm yeah. I'm yeah. really excited about that's exactly that. right. Exactly. Uh, so I think yeah. about that. Okay. So you're looking at your copay, $75. Now let's talk about a senior who is on nine to twelve medications, yeah. who's on a fixed income, who may if they are lucky, have five dollars of discretionary income a day. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, the people that we love that have built our country are having to choose between drugs or food. Mm -hmm. And this is inappropriate for a country like ours. We should not be, we, we've got to change our system. Yeah. I mean, there is a moral, uh, we just have to have a North Star and we have to, we have to get there. Our seniors should not be choosing between rent or drugs. Mm -hmm. Am I going to eat today? Um, now I'm going to ration my drugs. So I'm going to cut everything in half. I'm not going to take my drugs correctly, yeah. or I'm not going to take them at all. It's just it's it's inappropriate. Yeah. We need to do better for our country, and I'm I'm so excited to be a part of the group leading the charge on that front. And like you said earlier, like we need to get more people involved in this. Yeah. This the, the, this the, we need to make these changes. It's critical to the stability of our country. I'm going to come back to that one in, in a minute. I just want to ask you one other thing. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to come back to uh, because you talked about uh, obviously aging in place, the importance of telehealth, and some of yeah. uh, the initiatives that you spearheaded there. Um, obviously, you know the, the, this COVID uh, problem uh, has dramatically impacted seniors uh, substantially compared to to other age groups. Uh, are there any? Um, I don't want to say positives, but have, have there been positive? Uh, uh, things that have come out of the pandemic in the sense, you know, it, we're learning that these viruses, because, you know, the, the elderly immune system deals with them differently than, than my kids and so forth. Uh, has, have there been any sort of positive things that have come out uh, in your research at West on, okay, you know, here's, this pandemic was awful, but we've learned this important stuff in terms of, uh, in this case, sort of immunology and infectious diseases and aging benefits any, any important learnings here um, that you might want to mention yeah so i would love to follow up with you on this and and when you have marty on your show marty mccary he can talk about some of the research sure. that johns hopkins and um and and west health will be collaborating on around looking at around the equity okay. through an equity lens of how covid has affected um seniors we know that 80 percent of the deaths of covid um uh, are within uh, the senior age bracket. Eight in 10 deaths from COVID are, mm -hmm. are seniors. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I think that there is an opportunity to learn from that. I think more than that, perhaps, we have had a light shining on the fact that seniors need better care. Okay. We need to do better for seniors in this country. We have to deploy telehealth, but we have to also remember the importance of human relationships. Loneliness is real in America, especially oh, yeah. among seniors. Um, and there was a study by Harvard, and the study showed that loneliness in a senior is the equivalent, has the, takes the same physical toll on your body as smoking 17 cigarettes a day. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just feel like we have a lot of seniors in rural areas. We have a lot of seniors in urban areas that are, that are shut-ins that aren't able to get to congregate sites and their loved ones are 3,000 miles away. Um, we, we really need to think about retooling kind of the fabric of, of our society to, to better include seniors um, 
in, in daily life. They can't be lonely. They can't be alone. While we can touch them through telehealth, we've, we have to do better. And I'm really excited about one area that where, where we kind of focus on this, and that okay. is through our PACE programs, okay. through the program for the all-inclusive care for the elderly. Like you said earlier, Ira, seniors want to age in place. They don't want to go to a nursing home. They, they don't want to go to a hospital. They want to be at home. They want to, you know, I think all of our goals is to die at home, you know, with, with our loved ones, um, surrounded by our loved ones. And um, so the program for the all-inclusive care for the elderly is a new, is a, is a different system of care where we take on the responsibility as a provider of care and, and the insurer of care and, um, and provide care soup to nuts. So we're looking at the social determinants of health as well as the medical components of health. Oh, yeah. So we're looking at nutrition. We're looking at our daily living, um, is, is, is your home safe? Is it, is it fall proof? No scatter rugs, no, you know, do you have grab bars in your bathroom? Um, do you get, or is someone coming to your house to help you bathe, to help you do your dishes? Um, do you, you have access to the rehab that you may need? Do you have access to the drugs that you need? Are you able to get the transportation you need to go to a congregate site for meal or whatever that might be? So we're looking at a person from a very holistic way. And what we're finding and what the evidence shows is are these programs, PACE programs, the program for the all-inclusive care for the elderly, have better health outcomes and a much better quality of life. Oh, yeah. So imagine you don't need to live the last two years of your life in a nursing home. You can now be at home. So we're very excited about that model and then deploying telehealth on top of that. It, it's, it's, I, you know, I think it's very exciting. We have to have human touch oh, yeah. as well as the high tech touch. Obviously you mentioned the issue of loneliness uh, and yeah. that's, you know, uh, yeah, definitely a, a major, a major problem. You um, you also sit on the board of an organization called Generations United, which, correct me if I'm wrong, sort of is trying to merge this gap. We, we have lonely elderly people. We have youth that will benefit from interaction. Yes. Could you talk about this uh, organization? Generations United is an amazing organization based in Washington, D.C. It's got a, a, a board made comprised of a whole host of us from around the nation, very focused on just what I said, united, just what you said, uniting the generations. So there are um, some amazing programs that GU are putting together. For example, um, several different college campuses in the United States will now have an opportunity for, for students to have um, a decrease in tuition and room and board because they are going to live yeah. with a senior. So they're going to provide some companionship to the senior and they're going to help the senior with some daily tasks of living, with some shopping, and, and then have a tuition re, uh, remission from that. Um, so those are just some kind of innovative things, but uh, grandparents, providing support to grandparents who are now raising children and youth because parents have died from opioid addiction. Yeah. So there's some really important programs and, and um, focus areas of Generations United. I would encourage all of your listeners to check GU out. Um, and it's a, a really important program with Uniting the Generations, which takes me back to my very opening statement around being so lucky to have been partially raised by my own grandparents Absolutely. that instilled you know really important values and taught me the importance and of of coming together with all ages and learning um, at all points in your life absolutely absolutely uh, what's, what's next for for shelly lightford um a little wrap up here obviously it's not like you're not doing it you're not doing it <laughs> enough, but um, in between running all these organizations and serving on different boards and, and playing basketball, I guess, occasionally. Um, what's the next 10 years look like? What any, any big 
plans? Yeah. Business, uh... Wow, that's such a great question, Ira. Thank you. So we're so excited at West Health to be able to, you know, further magnify the importance of um, of successful aging. Uh, we do want to replicate some of our programs and some of our uh, nonprofit business models throughout the United States. Really excited about taking Civica RX right now. We're very focused on uh, Part B drugs, injectables in the hospital. Yep. We want to segue into the Part D area, okay. and we really want to tackle the cost of those high-cost drugs that you and, and I and everyone in America has to buy. Um, and excited about um, just having a louder voice in, in both Washington and Sacramento to really implement some of those important policy changes. The next 10 years are going to be pivotal and we're excited about making some of those changes. Wonderful, wonderful. Ira, thank you so much. Shelly, it was a real pleasure having you. Thank you for, for taking the time to come on the show and thank you for everything you're doing for the, the, the country, hopefully. We'll replicate this model worldwide, but it was a real pleasure having you. Thank and, you. Uh, we'll definitely stay in touch.